though. She's just so good at everything, and yet she's so dumb. We're going to talk about the worst books of 2019. And before I get into this, I really do want to make a disclaimer that not all books are for all people. There is quite a high likelihood of my worst books of 2019 not being your worst books. And I also want to say like this is not me bashing the author because all of these authors are wonderful people. They are gorgeous. Unless a scandal comes out, in which case they are awful people and I knew it all along. Like I said, this this is not bashing authors. This is only about their books. And honestly, like sometimes a book just doesn't work. It could just be the day I was having, the week I was having. It just might not have hit me the right way. I remember the first time I read To Kill a Mockingbird when I was like in fifth grade or so, I was so mad at it. I was like, okay, I get it. Racism is a bad thing. I don't know why I have to read a whole book about it. And then I reread it in college and I was like, got it. It was an incredible reread. So there is like a potential that like if I were to reread these books, maybe I would love it more. Maybe like I would look at it with fresh eyes and this book would be like, holy crap, I love it. But as of now, these were the worst books I read in 2019. I also want to say like these are not books exclusively published in 2019. I'm just doing the books that I have read in 2019. I'm also eliminating books where I read it in 2019 but it's not published yet because I don't think it's fair of me to tell you like it was the, one of the worst books I read in 2019 when you all haven't had a chance to read it yet. This is also not in an really an order because they're all kind of equally on that level. As another disclaimer, I'm going to be talking about the parts I didn't like in these books. So that might have been at the beginning, the middle, the end, the whole thing. There might be some spoilers. I'm going to try and shy away from like the big plot points, but how can you talk about what you hate about a book by not saying anything about it, you know? Okay, so let's get started. One of the first books that I've read this year was the final for the Shades of Magic series by V.E. Schwab. And I really liked the first one. The second one went in a completely different direction. The third one didn't work. To catch you up on the series, in this world there are four Londons. There's Black London, which has like wild, untamed magic. White London, which has like a cruel form of magic. Red London has a kind of like the magic when you think of like just a kind of like happy magic-y stuff. And Grey London, which is the one kind of closest to our world now where there isn't any magic. And in the first book, Lila comes from Grey London, but she's always wanted more to life. She crosses to Red London and she figures out magic. Meanwhile, there's Kel, who's an Ant Antari. That's like a special kind of being which can cross between the different realms and has like all these magical powers. What you find out in the first book is that sort of magic from Black London became a sentient and then it tried to take over the rest of the world and that's not very good. So the magic, the sentient magic started to come through the world and there's this huge like fight and trying to save everyone. So that part it's all great. I loved it. I was like, holy crap, I'm so into this world. But what really kind of started to sour me on this is two things. One was the treatment of one of the characters. And I guess the other one is like the rewriting of the treatment of one of the characters. There's Holland, who is another Antari, and he's from White London. And you find out pretty early on in the series that like, He's under the control of the cruel ruler, so he has to do these horrible things. And after they break the hold, everyone still te treats him like absolute sh And to me, as a reader, it was extremely obvious that he regretted his actions, that he really wanted to do what was right for his country. And it, everyone just treated him like absolute crap. And it was almost borderline comedy, because it's like... 
so obvious from all the context clues that he's not some sort of freaking monster. But they're all like, I don't trust you, Holland. And it's just, it got annoying to me. Speaking of annoying, let's talk about Lila. So Lila is like, if you remember earlier, she's a gray Londoner, made her way to red London. As the books went on, it almost felt like she had like a golden touch. Everything she did worked, even when it shouldn't. And that really annoyed me. It honestly just felt like the author really liked her character and wanted to give her the best, which ended up being frustrating for me as a reader because I'm like, how does, how did this happen with Lila? It really didn't feel like she earned her place at all. And the nail on the coffin for me would be when we have this from the author. We're getting spicy early, aren't we? I feel like I need a backpedal before I even start, so I'm going to do that real fast. I... Love it when authors include LGBTQ plus characters. Like the king in this world, he was gay. He found a lover. Never really explained how the succession actually worked when you have two gay kings. Anyway, so like I love that. I want more books to be inclusive. What really annoys me is when authors back it into the story. <sighs> Reading slash slightly paraphrasing, but I'll put it up here. The Instagram post from the author was said she probably would have made Lila non-binary in the canon, so in the actual series. However, she would not have had the societal context, awareness, or vocabulary for it. And that's why she, the author, uses she slash her pronouns. This reminds me a lot of J.K. Rowling and Dumbledore was gay thing, which in all honesty, I don't have a problem with that specifically because I can't really see a situation where your teacher sits, sets you down and says, uh, let me tell you, Harry, I was a teenager. I had a lot of gay sex with a really evil wizard in the end. So cheers. So like, it, to me, that makes sense. I mean, like maybe she, JK could have put some more clues in there, but like, I'm pretty much all right with that one. This one, on the other hand, people can correct me if I'm wrong, which, you know, odds are someone will, but I didn't see it at all. I did not see anything other than a slight distaste for dresses, which considering how much Lila runs around and does like things, I could see why she wanted pants. I didn't see anything that indicated that she was uncomfortable with her identification. I didn't see anything that indicated that she did not feel straight, heterosexual, cis character. And um, when you're saying that you're putting a nine binary character in there, I really feel like it's something you need to show your audience. And you could show that she felt not right, but also she didn't know what was wrong as well. So to me, this just feels like the author is back writing the series, which really does annoy me, especially when you have non-binary, which is arguably the marginalized of the marginalized societies out there. It just felt kind of not right. And then also like this might not be as strong as my other arguments, but like Okay, so you're telling me that Lila managed to do something that no one else in the world has been able to do, which is cross from Grey London to Red London, learn an entirely new language, learn magic, and become... She became a magic pirate. And she's hung up because she didn't know the right word for non-binary. And she was never introduced to the concept. The magic pirate. I don't know. Also, like, the society seems pretty open to begin with, especially considering the king is gay. <laughs> I mean, to me, it seems like Lila definitely could have run into these concepts if the author had actually wanted to show it, which is why this is book is just... It left a bad taste in my mouth, and I don't know if, how, if I'm really going to continue with the author, just because... Does anyone else pick up that 
she might be non-binary in there because apparently there's a huge number of queries who, who are asking this and I just anyway oh also if you have any non-binary books you could like recommend to me that would be lovely I don't really think I've ever read one so maybe I maybe I just don't recognize the signs because I've never read a book where the main character is like non-binary so you don't really pick it up I don't know, maybe. Let me know. Alright, so we're also doing another book that's not the first in the series. <laughs> so, if you guys aren't caught up, like, this is your chance. This is actually a series that I've decided to just cut off because I really couldn't get into it talking about the Red Rising series and it's been described as kind of Hunger Games but in space. And honestly that's a pretty good description. We follow Darrow. He's a red class citizen so that means that he spent his entire life in the mines and digging out like cores for future generations to build a world. However, he finds out that actually the worlds have been settled and nobody bothered to tell him and his people because they're getting free work out of the mine so why he finds out he's like okay I gotta get revenge they also kill his love of course typical YA aren't they so then he goes through a transformation and becomes a gold so each class of citizen has like a different color and they each have a different specialty maybe then he has to go through like this whole training which is book one which is like kind of like the hunger games but it's a like greek god theme so maybe it's more like Hunger Games, Percy Jackson, Slash. And then we have book two, which is where he is apprenticed, or maybe he starts to work for someone. Anyway, so that's book two. We start to work for them, and then he has to like think his way out of a situation or two. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I thought it was like really boring. I guess it's just because I'm not like really into politics. And there's a lot of like, shifting and like moving pieces and outwitting and outthinking. I didn't find myself to care about the intricacies. All of these issues that he has to solve are like long-term things. Like entire populations of humans are essentially sex slaves and they're made to feel good about being degraded and stuff, which like, that's just like kind of like tip of the iceberg. So every single class of humans have been like genetically altered so that they do their job the best way possible which means that they can only do specific jobs and then the golds are like the masters of everyone it just sounded like such a long time to fix this this is the kind of like societal issues which will take like decades to fix in any reasonable manner and i just don't want to stick around for it cousins <laughs> this one I don't think very many people have read I don't I didn't see a lot of reviews on it on Goodreads but my friend Angela's booked she read it and she and I have this thing where if we read a really terrible book we'll make the other person read it it's fun to find something to be miserable about together you know so anyway she read this one and she's like oh my god it's awful so she had me read it and I kind of agree. This is a book where like I was lost from beginning to end. I reread the beginning part on audiobook like two or three times. I couldn't get it and I was like, F it, maybe I'll pick it up later in the book. And that didn't happen at all. The best summary I can come up with this is like a pseudo steampunk historical romance with your third cousin. The thing that got me the most was the love interest. I don't know. I mean, like, okay, so as a scientist, if we want to get super technical, if you're a half third cousin with someone, the babies will pretty much come out fine. I mean, like, okay. But societally wise, as soon as I heard the word cousin, any sort of affection towards that couple was just gone. And I mean, like, even if they said, like, you know, fifth cousin, sixth cousin, twelfth cousin, 
I just the C word. The C word just kills me. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. There's that. And then like the whole plot was just jumpy, 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 jumpy. And I just couldn't follow it. So something you may have noticed is I really don't have any physical copies of these books because I mostly get the audiobooks. And then if I like the audiobook and I check it out twice from the library, then I will buy a book. However, I don't really buy books anymore on my own. That being said, War Cross. Actually, I got this one from Uppercase. First of all, absolutely fabulous company. I do really like that the, I have a signed copy of this book, but it's like, I feel like I've read this one before. So we have a absolutely gorgeous, but doesn't know it girl. And we have a dark brooding, mysterious boy. So she's an orphan, essentially. Her dad dies, her mom abandoned her. She's insanely good at many, many things. And she's very good at hacking. You don't really understand why, other than she's able to like kind of spot these patterns. For her entire life, she's looked up to Hideo and he is the creator of Warcross, which is like a virtual reality video game that everyone in the world plays and it's completely revolutionized how computers work. And because she's poor and an abandoned orphan, she decides to try and steal something from the Warcross games, gets caught, and then he gets hired by Hideo to find a spy. I don't know, like it just so much of it felt predictable and so much of it felt like Oh yeah, of course, so ends up being evil, ends up being good, oh no, she can't trust him, sort of thing. Plus, okay, so like I know like they say it several times that Hideo is only like a couple years older than her, but to me, in my brain, it felt very much like a teacher-student thing where like he seemed a lot older than her, so whenever they were together and like they're kissing or anything, like. I was just like, ah, no, you're once you have that dynamic in there, my brain is very much like, ah, I don't, I don't think so. Her thing was like, I don't know, she's just so good at everything, and yet she's so dumb. I mean, oh, come on, like, she falls for like the oldest tricks in the book, and I'm just like, uh, I can't do it. This next one actually probably deserves the tea. I don't know if many of you people like were aware of this a few years ago. Maybe it's just a year ago. But the author of the Kaki Rumi series, well, I should probably take this down. The author of the Kaki Rumi series tried to trademark the word Kaki and then get other authors to retroactively change the names of their series. She she had an argument where like she by writing her books and she's a self-published author that she transformed the word Kaki. In the way in the way that like Twilight is copyrighted in relation to Stephanie Meyer. Twilight has transformed the word Twilight. So you can copyright like a commonplace word. So Felina decided to copyright the word cocky and like her as far as like her cocky roomy series to kind of like summarize that um it didn't work i actually like was really interested when this was coming out and i read the transcripts which is like the most hilarious read i think those uh, uh, lawyers have ever gotten <laughs> but if we go to strictly the book author drama aside so in this series we have drew charles which is a divorcee, only ever been with one man. My God, Southern Belle. And she just needs to find something to help her get off her feet. You might be wondering about the accent. That's because Felina actually spelled out the accent, which is a... <sighs> which was probably one of the most painful things I've had to read in a long time. And then we have Jake Cocker, one of the Cocker brothers, who just so happens to be absolutely gorgeous, full of himself, and honestly is a lawsuit waiting to happen if the way she got her job is 
anything to judge by. I typically don't read this, these kinds of books just because I just, I, the realism is a sticking point for me. I just, I can't. In this book, Drew becomes his roommate, hence cocky roomie. And then like they slowly fall for each other. And by slowly, like they were hit by a truck and there's just so many lustful looks, furious, alone time activities, pining, and then of course bending each other over desks and whatnot. Plus the brothers were like weirdly into each other's sex lives. It was a little bit like, okay. I mean, like, honestly, I don't have a brother. Anyway, so that's my first foray into Felina. Um, I don't think I'll be returning to this series. So we go from very much um, not a woman positive series to a very, like, I guess it was supposed to be like a very uplifting book, but it just didn't hit the mark. So The Female Persuasion by Meg Wolitzer. Wolitzer? It was boring for me. Like maybe if I was like, I don't know. I get a lot of comments when I read a book that's supposed to be like one of the more intelligent books and I don't like it, that people just say like, oh, well, you didn't get the book. And like, maybe that's the case for this one. But as of right now, I feel like I got the point, but I just didn't like it. For this one, we follow Greer Kadetsky. So she's always felt like things were off. Like later on, she sees Faith Frank, so like an uber feminist from back in the 80s. Faith Frank makes a speech at Greer's college, and the two of them kind of like hit it off, and Greer ends up working for her. And there's this whole message about like having the loud feminism, which is like Greer's work. And there's the quiet fe feminism from like stu people just like doing their everyday thing. And it just got to the point where like the book felt like it was building and building and building and nothing happened. And I was just kind of like, yay. So next we have Smallville, I mean Superman Dawnbreaker. And that one's by Matt De La Pena. So we have Superman aka Clark Kent, he's a teenager, he's going through puberty, his powers are going crazy, and then there's also like all these issues happening in his world. Um, people are disappearing, immigrants, and there's this whole racial endotone. The worst part about this one was like it's not bad, it's just done already. And I feel like this series, like I really loved from this series, and this is like a whole series called DC Icons and different famous YA authors take on a different superhero. So, so there's already been Wonder Woman, there's been Catwoman, there's Superman, there's been Batman. So those characters are so popular that there's really nothing left for the authors to really explore or create a new dimension or relaunch. Just because like, I feel like every angle has been done and their characters have been so well do documented that there's specific things that you know will never happen. Like, they'll never be in serious danger. They will never actually die. They'll never have like a face scarring incident. Like you just, you know there's like these limitations. Catwoman, I mean, it's written by the master. So like that one was good. That being said, I feel like this series could really work, but they would have to pick different characters. Because if you have the main character, like Superman, Batman, you can't do as much as you could with a side character like Catwoman. And so I really feel like this concept of like superhero books written by famous YA authors would be wonderful they just need to choose different characters. So the next one I have is Amber and Dusk and that one's by Lyra Celine. And I think this is her first book, which honestly, as a first book, I've read a lot worse, but I've also read better. The main character is an orphan. 
She's motivated by bullying and repression. The world is very similar to ours, except for like a few key terms are changed. Like instead of months, they have spans because in this world, you don't have day, night. It's all night, which uh, as a scientist, the, the world is dead. The world is so dead if this actually happened. They also have magic, so maybe that's why they're still alive. Everyone hates the orphan. She is overconfident to the point where it's like really annoying and like jarring to the reader. Everyone in this book, of course, has a snappy nickname and like a cool twist and powers. And of course it has my favorite YA trope, which is rent, you throw a random gown on the character and she gets to play a little dress up, feel pretty before it's snatched away. It just felt like a cookie cutter. I felt like I've read this one so many times and I'm kind of tired of reading it and rereading it. I, f I feel like this author does have a lot of potential and I'm really looking forward to what she writes next. Maybe it, maybe it's because I read this one when I was coming off of like a long haul of YA. So like the tropes are like particularly forward in my mind. Children of Blood and Bone. I was so excited for this one. I was like waiting for it from the library for six months for the audiobook. The cover drew me in, the concept loved it. And then I read it and it didn't work at all. So I will say that like the setting was very intriguing to me. Okay, so like backing up slightly so this one we have Zeely and she was part of like a magic society however the whole magic of this world is like taken out she's left with no magic and there's a chance to get magic back she teams up with a princess they're pursued by a prince she and her brother are trying to desperately get a scroll and complete like a few tasks along the way to certain people to restore magic to the land. So like that whole thing, I like the idea of it. It did sound a little bit like something I've read before. Like the, it kind of almost had like a Avatar The Last Airbender sort of vibe to it where like you have a bunch of like some magic users, some not traveling together. They're being pursued by someone who has like some magic as well. I really felt kind of like a little bit of a Zuko in there. So like I was very intrigued and into this series and it just didn't work. I think the problem was is like, despite the uniqueness of the setting, the actual actions didn't feel that unique to me. I think it's just cause like every time they did something, my mind was like, oh, well that will probably be what happens next. And it happened next. It felt like, formulaic maybe is the right word and uh, I just I couldn't get into it I just couldn't find it in my heart to continue with this series even the last one was a, was a book that I was told to read over and over and over and over because everyone seems to love it and I waited forever for this book to come in from the library. This one, I could not stand it. Right away, it just felt formulaic. It felt like she was checking off a YA list. The main character finds herself super ugly, and yet everyone else thinks she's beautiful. She's super humble to the point where I'm like, Good lord, girl, find yourself some confidence. You can shoot light out of your hands. Like, what the hell? And then there's a love triangle. Both love interests are strapping young men. One is this down-home hero. One is, like, this supernatural being who is, of course, over 100 years older than her. Because if it's less than 100 years older than you, it's creepy. She ends up finding out she has, like, these super special powers that no one else in the world has. And she has to go train and become a Grisha, which is yada, yada, yada. And I just, I couldn't get into it. It just, it didn't work for me. And I think it's mostly because it felt like a very average YA. And like the whole book felt like just chock full of these vaguely inspirational sentences. 
she kept trying to kill herself like she, well, okay not not like that but it's like every cause was a cause worthy to die over and i was just like no honey it really isn't just use some common sense and i think you'd be all right and of course i ended up finishing the rest of the the main trilogy because everyone was telling me like after you read the first three books the next two were like where the series really hits it off and like I'm just, I've, I read the last one in September and I still am not feeling emotionally ready to start anything else from Bardugo. And like the thing is like everyone loves her and I'm like maybe it's just the series that like did not work at all. I don't know. Alright, so that's it for me. Those are the worst books that I've read this year. Maybe a better title would be like the most disappointing reads like but like some of them I wasn't really expecting much to begin with, so oh well. But for the most part, I really did enjoy this year in books. And these are like honestly the only I think it was like ten or so. The only ten or so books where I'm like, gosh, I wish I had that time back. What are your top three worst books you've ever read? Like I'm talking like hundred percent your over your entire life. What are the worst books? Bye.